I set out for a rugged journey across 12,000 foot passes, averaging 15 miles per day. That was wild. What gear passed my Colorado trail test? Some gear performed amazing, while other items left something to be desired. Today, I'm handing out my gear grades for what I took backpacking on a 75 mile stretch of the Colorado Trail. I'm fresh off the trail. I got a few blisters. I'm pretty sore and weary. And so I wanted to go through all of the gear, or at least most of the gear that stood out to me, and give it some grades. Because it was pretty beefy out there, and I had some challenging conditions and weather and wind. And I feel like it gave everything a pretty good opportunity to either pass or fail. I wanna lead off with one of the brand new items because I had so many people really curious about this product in the last video that I did. This one right here is the new Nemo Tensor, the all season version. I've been using the Tensor for the last handful of trips and really enjoyed it but they managed to up the R value on this one from 4.2 to 5.4 while technically shaving off a couple of grams of weight. That sounds pretty promising right there. And in reality, this thing kicked ass. It was so good. Now, my grade for this is an A minus. Now, the only reason why I have any knock whatsoever to say on it is just because of its size. I thought that I was actually getting the 25 inch wide version, which is the version that I have been generally carrying lately over the last few years, especially as I age and sleep becomes such an important part of the backcountry equation for me. So I accidentally got the 20 and that was on me, but that's my only knock is that sleeping on a 20 inch wide mattress versus a 25 inch wide mattress actually for me, I think is a pretty significant difference. And for those of you who haven't tried the wider mattresses, I, if you're interested in really upping your sleep game, that's one of the easiest ways to do it. However, for what this is supposed to be, this totally knocked it out of the park. This thing was rock solid and dead comfortable and very, very warm. Granted, the temperatures weren't super chilly. I would say they got into the low 40s, would probably be about the lowest temperatures. And at that temperature, it's really hard to tell the difference between a 4.2 R value and a 5.4 R value because the ground really just isn't quite that cold to truly give you that data, that feedback that, yeah, you need the better R value. That being said, I loved this and I'm super excited for this to release in October. I think it's gonna kick some major ass out there and it is a great pad for anybody who's looking for a quality sleeping mattress. Next on the list, I kind of was a little hesitant about bringing this at all in the first place. This is the Helinox Chair Zero L, the luxury or large version of it. I'm not sure what the L stands for. By the time I got all my camera equipment in my backpack, it was kind of heavier than I was hoping and expecting. So this almost got left behind. I'm really glad that I didn't leave it behind because at the end of the day, after some of my days hiking up to 17 and a half, almost 18 miles, getting to collapse into this chair and not have my only place of rest be in my tent, in my sleeping bag, this was so helpful. For the weight at one pound, I think it's six ounces, I think it's absolutely something that I will carry in the future. If I were to do this again, I think I would go for the non-L version and just get the regular. It shaves five or six ounces off. It's a tiny bit smaller and a little bit more compact. I just don't quite need the extra weight capacity that this is good and rated for. But I'd give this an A plus and I am so, so thrilled that I took this thing. Let's go kind of on the other end of the spectrum and speak to something that I was honestly kind of frustrated with. Something that I've actually had pretty good luck with in the past, but my life straw. I would give it a D. A lot of that grade actually needs to come and reflect upon me and not the product. When I was packing, either through negligence or forgetfulness, I didn't bring the back flushing syringe. It turns out that this was incredibly frustrating and slow to use after the first day. I was filtering mostly pretty pristine water. So the fact that it got bogged down and frustratingly slow, I was 
kind of upset at life straw at it. Granted, if I had brought the syringe, I could have just back flushed it and gotten it back up to speed, but it was really painfully slow. Ugh. Really squeeze this bag to get the water to move through it. The D is for me and the D is for life straw because ideally it's not getting clogged or bogged down in clean water situations. If you didn't bring the syringe, you're just kind of out of luck. I don't know how to clean this thing without being able to force water back through it. And that's what the syringe is for. Generally speaking, I've had good luck with this and I will continue to use life straw but this was one of the biggest pain points of the whole trip for me was filtering water. I thought I'd mention that. Mention that. I thought I'd mention that. I think I just went by you all of a sudden. Next is my sleeping bag. Now this is deceptive because it's in a Sea to Summit event bag, but this is the Nemo Riff, the 15 degree mummy bag. I would again give this an A minus. And I'm really glad that I opted for the mummy bag over the quilt that I was debating taking because it did get cold and I did really actually want to just have that hood and have that comfort. I love being able to open up those gills for the warmer nights and I could zip up and be very comfortable. The only real knock that I think comes with the Riff is just that it's still a little bit of a heavier bag for mummy bags. It's about a pound heavier than a quilt. But I have used some mummy bags that are still a little bit lighter than this one. And so that's really the only ding. And it's a pretty minor because we're only talking about really a couple of ounces here. But all things considered, I think that the Nemo Riff 15 degree mummy bag, it'll be like my, my go-to mummy bag when a mummy bag is the right thing to take. So good job, Nemo. You've been crushing it with all the gear that I've been using lately. So I want to give that my endorsement here. Next, sticking with sleep, is the Durston. And this is the X-Mid Pro. Durston was all over the Colorado Trail. I saw a ton of people either using these tents or carrying Durston packs. And it's kind of what gives you some street cred on the trail or trail cred, I suppose. I loved having this tent. And again, I'm going to give it an A minus. Why not an A plus? I mean, it is about as bomber and lightweight of a tent as you can go. And that's true. This thing performed exceptionally well, except for moisture management. That is my biggest ding with this tent. It, moisture management was a bit of a battle throughout the whole trail. It rained a lot, it was very dewy at night, and this thing I think only did okay at moisture management. It did great at everything else. I even, one of the nights I had some serious wind, thunder, rain, a big storm moved through actually twice on me and this thing was rock solid. What I love about the DCF fabric that this is, is that it doesn't sag and flex like the nylon does. When you pair that with a good set of trekking poles that are setting that up, basically didn't even budge, despite the fact that I had some pretty strong winds. Not crazy strong, but I would say at least over 30 mile an hour winds. This thing held up without even sweating it in the slightest. One other thing, is when you do set this up on uneven ground, like where maybe it's not exactly just flat or maybe not even just a little bit off canter, it's like kind of undulating a little bit and that's the best site you can find. I find that the tent doesn't set up as nicely. It really prefers having even distribution all over the place. And if you just introduce some wonky angles, then the tent starts to kind of sag and dip in a couple of places that really affects your interior living space. A freestanding tent will maintain a lot of its headroom and a lot of its space, whereas this, it did diminish because, while well, introducing some terrain factors that are sometimes unavoidable. Next, I wanna bring up my other big item that was a big curiosity point an excitement factor in my last video. The Mystery Ranch Radix. It's too tall here for fitting in this whole thing. Oh, I should buckle that up. That is so unprofessional. I'm very excited about this backpack and I think that it is a pretty stellar movement in the right direction for Mystery Ranch to go more lightweight. I do wanna say that this isn't an ultralight backpack. 
it weighs over three pounds. And so I would just consider it lightweight, not ultralight. It's still got some room to shed some weight in my opinion, to really go into that kind of like through hiker bag. But I actually loved my experience with this backpack and think that it is going to be a phenomenal backpack for people who are interested in through hiking or even just regular backpacking. I think it's a big development for Mystery Ranch. What's my grade on it? Well, I give it an A minus. Nothing here is absolutely gosh darn perfect. So when I originally set out for the trail, I had this shifted just a hair by about half an inch and it was pretty comfortable. But on the second day, I just wondered, it's like, you know what, if I mess with this a little bit, I wonder if I can dial in that fit just a little bit better. I lengthened the torso by half an inch and it was significantly more comfortable. And you can't do that with a lot of through hiking backpacks. They just are one thing. There's no adjustment ability. That is where some of the weight comes in, but I honestly think that that's worth it. This is just a more comfortable backpack than some of the ones I've used from Hyperlite, from Waymark, from Outdoor Vitals. I found it to be a very pleasant. The other things that really excelled with this backpack are these giant side pockets that also have this elastic ability to cinch it up. I was able to fit a water bottle, a water filter, and a tripod on this side, as well as trekking poles, a water bottle, and sometimes even my trekking poles, trekking poles, an umbrella, and a water bottle on this side. So the ability to really stack things up on the side was so, so nice. I actually really loved that. This dump pocket here was the perfect place to keep and store my rain gear that I needed to get in and out of my backpack all the time. A lot of these straps are actually removable. They're just girth hitched in, which I think is a pretty cool development. So granted, if something fails, the fix is really simple. And if you decide that you didn't want some of these, like maybe this one, you could just ditch it and just simply just take it off. And if you wanted to put it back on later, you haven't like damaged it. You haven't cut something off. The other big difference between this and like a roll top through hiking bag is that there's actually a top loader and a lid. This is where I stored a lot of my snacks and that meant that I could keep my food set in here for the day. Taking it off, taking a break, getting snacks was super, super easy. I didn't have to get into the main compartment. And then one more thing that I think was really stinking cool. If you undo these clips here, you can, I just have a stuffing sleeping bag here to give it some form, but you can zip this all the way down to the bottom. And so that meant that when it was time to say get to camp and set up my tent really quick before a storm moved in, I could just zip this down, pull out just my Durston tent and set that up real quick while everything else was still in the backpack and protected mostly, at least from the rain. The only other backpack I've seen be able to do something similar is the Shadow Light from Outdoor Vitals. And both are great. And I, I liked this particular version's entry. It was just a little bit bigger but the Outdoor Vitals version is also awesome too. I think that this is a really exciting backpack for Mystery Ranch. Give it that A minus. For those who are curious, I will do a very full and more complete breakdown of that backpack. That was just kind of my quick hitting rundown of the Mystery Ranch Radix. Let's go back to something that I think, again, was kind of a pain point. And to me, it was my trekking poles. These are the trail backs from Black Diamond. I'd give them a D plus. I think that they were good, but below average. At $100 for the pair, so 50 bucks a piece, they're Black Diamond's kind of just more basic trekking poles. And they felt like basic trekking poles. I don't think it's very reasonable for people to pay 200 or even $300 for a set of trekking poles. That's like the last place that I'd really spend money. So it's not that I think that these are bad trekking poles. Having used some of the nicer ones, I did notice that I got really frustrated with these locking mechanisms. They're just really stiff. And especially when your fingers are cold and wet and you're trying to do something quickly or you're trying to set up your tent that rely on trekking poles, getting these to lock back and forth was just kind of not as nice as some of the other ones where the locking mechanisms are just butter smooth. These felt more like 
a basic trekking pole. And that's what they are. I can't really knock them too far. They didn't fail. They were good trekking poles. Having used the nicer ones, I felt that I was missing the nicer ones. But they're very strong trekking poles. They were dead sturdy. The further along I went on the trail, the more I relied upon these trekking poles. I got tired and they made a huge, huge difference. So I'm hesitant to give them that D plus, but it is, I think that they're slightly below average trekking poles. I just really wished that they had a cleaner, more smooth locking mechanism, which you're gonna get when you just pay for the more premium trekking poles. Footwear. This is actually something I made a last minute decision on. I was supposed to take these Merrell's MTL MQMs, very lightweight, very breathable shoes. And when I got to, I just threw these into my car just in case I maybe wanted to switch. And I'm glad that I did because when I got to Durango, it was raining a ton and there was a bunch of rain in the forecast. So rather than having a really breathable shoe where I was gonna be hiking through rainy monsoony weather all the time, I wanted something with Gore-Tex. So I opted for these. These are the Moab Speed Mid Gore-Tex shoes. Ultimately, it was a good decision. I still only wanna give these an A minus. They held up, they kept my feet dry. That was amazing, that's where they excelled. But where they didn't excel was just how much more warm these were than the other MTL MQMs, very intuitive name to say. I started to get some hot spots and blisters on my last day because it was just a hot day and I didn't, there wasn't the cloud cover, there wasn't the rain. That's my only ding. I'm glad that I took these though and they were very comfortable. They're super light. These are surprisingly light for as big of a shoe as these are. So I actually think that these are a really fun, good over the ankle hiking shoe, especially if you do want that Gore-Tex. Do totally recommend them. Just don't bring them where it might also be kind of hot because your feet might get kind of swampy in them. Let's go to the hyperlight stage of the video here. This camera pod is changing the game for me in terms of how I manage my camera equipment. I was in some total downpours and this thing kept my camera totally dry. Having it hanging off my chest the whole time meant that I didn't have to think hard about, oh, do I need to pull out my camera? I could have it comfortably on my chest and I could always take out my camera. For anybody who's out there who's a hiking photographer, this thing is the way to go. I think it's way better than the Peak Design version. The only other thing I wanna say is I accidentally had one of these little silica packets in from the actual, the brand new backpack that I took and ended up throwing it in here and it really helped keep this a dry space. So if you're a hiking photographer, check out the camera pod. This is the L or the large version and it fits a larger DSLR really well. This thing was great. Again, was one of the items that I was like, oh, maybe I'll ditch this. I don't know how much I'll use it. It rained a lot. This thing withstood some pretty serious hail and it held up great. It's shown very little signs of wear and tear, almost none. And so, you know what? I'm gonna go ahead and give up my rare A plus for this hiking umbrella. Now it might be a little niche and it might not be for you, but I saw a lot of through hikers carrying this and I was super glad for mine. Let's go black to, uh, let's go black to black diamond. Let's go black, oh my God. Let's go back to black diamond and talk about my rain gear. Honestly, these were A's. Actually, let's go with A pluses. These are the lightest rain shells that, uh, hard shells that I've used. They're lighter than Arcteryx, they're lighter than anything else that I've used, and I think that they handled everything phenomenally. I actually did a lot of miles in my full rain gear, which is pretty uncommon. Usually that's not something you wanna do. You don't really wanna hike in these things because it's pretty sweaty, but they have pit zips here on the rain jacket, and then these full zip rain pants were awesome because I could take them on and off without taking off my boots, that's why you wanna have the full zip. These are probably less than half the weight of the Arcteryx rain pants that I've used for a really long time that are also great, but at so much lighter of a weight, these are really easy to just throw in and better to hike in for more mileage. Honestly, these rain shells, the Stormline, so good. They're the best I've used and I will be using these for sure moving forward. The Storm R from Black Diamond is a really solid headlamp. I'd give it an A minus. The only ding I'd have for it is just the size and weight. It's kind of a bulky headlamp. I was hiking from pretty much sunrise to sunset. I did very little 
in the actual full dark. The amount of time that I ran this was probably less than an hour. There are some cool things. This little side swipe, just by like touching the side, I think that's pretty cool. You can cycle through your, your light settings pretty easily with this, and there's still more if you want to deep dive into it but I really like that you can lock it. All things considered, this is a great headlamp and for anybody doing more like mountaineering or let's say you're climbing a big wall, then this is gonna be a great headlamp because you really have that ability to project a beam. But for backpacking, I'd probably go for one of their more lightweight versions. Probably like the Spot 400 would be the sweet spot for backpacking. Couple more things, let's talk about my stove. This is the Grail Titanium Stove that weighs one ounce, and a lot of people have commented on how much similar this looks to the BTS stove. I don't really know if this is a white label stove, but I am a big fan of this stove. I think it was great. It has pretty much replaced my pocket rocket for me. It really does this exact same job while being smaller and lighter and cheaper. This thing is like $24, and the pocket rocket's like $50 to $60, I think. I don't really see a functional difference in the two, and at one ounce and $24, I think, this is my new go-to stove. This is the Vargo Bot 700. It's kind of the perfect little pair to keep everything kind of nestled in here. Love this little duo of the Grail titanium stove and this Vargo titanium bot. Last but not least, I wanna give a grade to me and on my food prep, and I'd give myself a D minus. It wasn't quite a failing grade, but this is how much food I came back with. This is way too much food. I way, way, way overpacked on food. That is one of the biggest things that I have to improve on is, and it's, I make, make the mistake so often. I often overestimate how much food I'm gonna need. I brought a lot of things that I was just like, oh, maybe I'll get hungry, throw this in, and I just never ate it. It is kind of me being on the safe side of things, like if I wanted to stay an extra day or if I got an injury and couldn't hike as fast, but I really wished that I had shaved three to four pounds off my pack weight, I could have done a way better job on my food. So I give myself a D, I said D minus, but I'll, I'll be a little bit more lenient upon myself. I'll give myself a D for the food prep. Everything else I did, I think I did a pretty good job and I was pretty happy with out there on the trail. That isn't every item that I backpacked with, but I think that those were the things that I really wanted to talk about and give you my update of how it performed on the Colorado Trail. It was an amazing experience and I can't wait to show you the full length video that is coming as soon as I can make it. It is just a little bit more of an in-depth edit. So stick around for that video. And if you didn't check out the original gear packing list, make sure that you go check out that video, which I'll have linked to here. Let me know your thoughts. I'd love to hear if you have some qualms with my ratings, with my grades, and uh, I wanna hear from you. So thanks so much for watching. I'm Eric Hansen, see you later.